Hello everyone, Loremaster of Sotek here, and it's time for the final blog post when it comes to the update for Shadows of Change 4.2. Today we have the Kislevite update, which should come with kind of all of the final little wrappings and bits that have to do with Shadows of Change, so we're not going to waste any time. Without further ado, let's hop right into it. So... Patch 4.2, Shadows of Change, Content Editions Part 3, Kislev. So what do we have here for... Ooh, wow, we've got like a whole post about... From Games Workshop, it looks like. All right, from Rich. Before I get into all the details of what to expect from Kislev, I'm excited to confirm that Patch 4.2 will launch on Thursday, February 22nd. So, you heard of here from King Rich himself that next Thursday, so less than a week from today... We will all have the new update to Shadows of Change in our hands. Uh, I would say a lot of people seem to be looking forward to it. I'm personally very much looking forward to it. Uh, but let's see what all we have for Kislev in here. As I alluded to in our last blog, po uh, po bleh, last blog post on Zinch, there we go. <laughs> the team has been working hard to get this exciting new content in your hands. Can't wait to hear what you think. Next week, we're thrilled to say that Black Library author David Geimer is back with a brand new short story on The Witch of Kislev. And on Wednesday, we'll be publishing the full patch notes for 4.2 so you can get caught up on what to expect. That's ex th awesome. That's great. So patch notes on Wednesday and a new short story by David Geimer. That's awesome. Um, the last short story by David Geimer was really, really good. It had a couple of errors, but that's that's just part of the course for Black Library stuff. Um so I am very much looking forward to that. I'm I'm curious what mistakes will slip in because that those just kind of seem inevitable. But I hope it'll be a really fun good story. I really enjoyed his last Kiss or uh, Cathayan one. But uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. All right, here we go. Let's see what Games Workshop. Games Workshop is very busy. Uh, it's looking like so. Let's let's see what GW has to say. If you're like me, growing up with Warhammer as a longtime fan, seeing Kislev given new characters and units, it was a special moment. Uh, with the new additions of Mother Ostenka, Hagwitches, and other units. This is new uncharted ground for a faction. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba, taking an updated lore and deep dive into Kislev. Like with many things in life, this meant some out with the old and with the new. Mother Ostenka is a good example of this. In the new lore, she is Kislev's only true hag mother in the new and current lore that our game is based on. She is very much her own unique character with her own motives, desires, magical his items, and history. This is why you see her charge into battle atop her sled, pulled by things in the woods with her cauldron, rather than more direct references to real-world mythology, such as a giant fucking chicken hut. This new take with all the other additions to Kislev is what makes them exciting and brings them in line with other races in 8th edition Games Workshop lore. This is true of some other parts of past Kislevite lore. The distinct Ungol and Gospodar split within Kislev is something that's no longer at the forefront of Kislevite lore, instead taking a backseat to allow us to tell new stories with the faction. There's still nods to this, with the horse archers already being a game, but we're not going to see any more implemented in our game now or moving forwards. So you're not going to see any more big splits on Ungols and Gospodars, which, fine, you know, that is totally fine. You can think of Kislev in a similar way to books and resources that we use from Games Workshop making our game. We're focused on the newest army books, such as 8th edition or as close as possible, and miniatures, Rather than adding things from the early editions, RPG books, old miniatures, or peripheral novels and supplements that no longer embody the core nature of the character, race, and environment. By doing this, we're ensuring that we're showing you the most authentic version of the Warhammer world possible. So yeah, this is uh, this is basically just like the Zongor discussion back in the Zinch post, where the community was asking for a lot of things, and I wanted to see a lot of things, based on the lore that we, the public, had which was mostly drawn from Realms of the Ice Queen and, like, 6th edition Warhammer Fantasy. There was basically nothing after that. Uh, Kislev was one of those factions that received just very, very, very few updates. So, the idea that Games Workshop, you know, kind of basically came around uh, with the old world or however you want to look at it and started making an eighth edition book or functionally a seventh and eighth edition book for Kislev, which resulted in them taking it in some different directions and coming up with all kinds of new characters and ideas and altering a lot of things that came before. That's fine. That's, that's how this works. You know, that is, that is standard. 
if you were to compare the Lizardmen from like their fifth edition iteration to their eighth edition iteration, which is the one that this game is based off of, it is like wildly different. It is so, it's not even recognizable in most places. And don't even get me started on what came before then, back when the Lizardmen were a troglodyte cave dwelling race and the Slon were a warrior frog people race, which is where we got garbage like Kremlo and other like really weird stories. And they were, they're very, very odd looking race. Um, I did not like the old stuff very much. So, uh, this does not really surprise me. And it just goes to show that just like we saw with the Zinch post, that games workshop is very heavily involved now. And I think this is just going to be the standard going forward is that unlike what we saw with Warhammer one and two, which to be frank, Games Workshop was barely involved with. Um, they were very hands-off in their approach, which is why we got to see a lot of really bizarre decisions and some, most of which were not bad. They were just different. Um, but uh, yeah, it's going to be very, very interesting to see how this may affect things going forward, but I don't hate it. It's it's literally just what being a Warhammer fan is, is that you're going to see Games Workshop just kind of show up from time to time and kind of suddenly change things or take a sharp left turn, but that doesn't necessarily think they're getting worse. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's like a bad change. It just means it's a change, and we've got to kind of roll with the punches. That's always been one of the most interesting and sometimes difficult aspects of being a Warhammer fantasy fan, especially is that you're kind of working at, you're working within the framework of a company that sometimes makes good decisions. <laughs> so, uh, like I said, I don't think this is bad. Um, it certainly makes mother Ostankia stand out significantly more for her to be the only true hag mother. Um, but I would very much love to see, you know, the roleplay game get caught up with the new Kislevite lore. Like, I would love to see Cubicle 7 make an updated Kislev book, whether for the old world or for, like, kind of modern fantasy. Um, because that would really allow us, the, the fans and people who care about the lore, to be able to really dig down deep and figure out what is going on. Because I think for a lot of people, at least for me, I think a lot of the frustration when there is frustration comes from the fact that it kind of feels like we're just in the dark and Games Workshop is just, you know, Creative Assembly is being like, here are things we're doing. And it's like, oh, well, why aren't we using some of this old information? And it's it's difficult when they kind of turn around or like, because that's no longer <laughs> canonical, like that's no longer accurate lore. And it's like, well... I would love to see the accurate lore. Like, I really, really wish that Games Workshop would release the 8th edition kind of army books, even if they were just kind of legacy books, and they even if they didn't come with rules, though I'd love for them to come with rules. But, like, I would sell one of my kidneys for Games Workshop to kind of release all of the books that they've sort of made uh, to update these various factions. But that's enough on that. Let's get into the actual exciting stuff. Kislev Editions. So we'll start here. All right. I think I need to first address the elephant in the room when it comes to Kislev and the content that was offered at the launch of Shadows of Change and what wasn't the lack of a new spell lore for Mother Ostenka and the omission of Hag Mothers as a generic lord type. I'll start with the spell lore that we're using for 4.2 for both Ostenka and her Hag Witches to make full use of. The lore of the Hag will co be comprised of six new spells and a lore attribute focused on both hexing enemy units and overcasting to bless your own. I'll go into more detail on each spell in the section below. Coming back to Hag Mothers now, as previously mentioned, there's only one in the current lore, as told by Games Workshop, and this is Mother Ostenkia herself. This lore is very new, as Mother Ostenkia herself is in the intellectual property, so I want to let you know that I can share with you who she is, how she aids Kislev, and why there are no other Hag Mothers in the lore. Mother Ostinkia is a, a character of great importance to many Kislevites, acting as a guardian of the land in times of great peril, but also to be wary of and not to cross to avoid her wrath. It is her magic that is wielded in battle by both herself and her hag witches, and her unstoppable force that brings both man and nature to fight for her cause and that of Kislevs. With the exception of Mother Stenkia herself, the few other hags of Kislev are not generals. 
They have no interest in leading armies themselves. Instead, they help enact Mother Ostekia's will through aiding Kislev's other leaders and their forces. With this new lore in mind and staying as close and true to it as we can, we need to think... We need to look for other generic lord options for Kislev to feel instead of Hag Mothers. And I think we came up with a good option thanks to Games Workshop's help and guidance. The Druzina, which a lot of people have been talking about. Uh, so that's great. Awesome. Excited to see what that looks like. More on him later. Let's first take a look at the Lord of the Hag and show what new tricks Mother Stankia has at her disposal. Ooh, hoo, 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 hoo. The Lore of the Hags. Available to both Mother Ostankia and Hag Witches, the Lore of the Hag features six new spells and a new lore attribute. The spell lore is focused primarily on disrupting and hexing enemy units, but with a twist, as when overcasting these spells, they become augments you can use on your own forces. This complements Mother Ostankia's campaign mechanics of curses and blessings to provide more ways to play with this unique character in battle. And we got a little lore blurb here that says, The Hag Witches draw from the power of the woodlands, fins, and oblasts of Kislev holding those who stray into them terminally accountable. Incantations and curses take shape to summon forth the spirit magic of the land, blessing the Kislevites who fight for it and cursing those who may see it harmed. The lore attribute is the fate of interlopers. Those trespassing upon this ground soon find their fate is completely sealed, their end decided. Okay, I will say, I will say, I love... The fact that these, it, I really, really like the concept behind this lore. The idea that it is a, ooh, that is a really cool spell effect. Um, the idea that this entire lore is like hexes and curses simultaneously, that's really cool. Um, that's something we haven't really seen before, uh, maybe outside of mods. Um, but spells that are like affecting enemies and allies at once um, and having different effects. I like that. That's pretty hot. I'm not going to lie. So Fate of Interlo uh, Interlopers goes off every time you cast a spell. Uh, it provides a minor decrease to leadership to enemies while increasing spell resistance to allies. Cool. And then Forbidden Hens, which is a... Uh, forbidden Hens. <laughs> That's something different. Forbidden Fens, which I love the spell effect of it literally just summons a fen around you. The hag beseeches ethereal forces deep underground to seep upwards and hamper the progress of her enemies, draining all momentum from them. The Forbidden uh, Fens has an area of hexes, which is that it negatively affects enemy speed, charge speed, and vigor. However, if you overcast it for the blessing, it instead becomes Whispers in the Woods, which creates an augment that positively affects allied speed, charge speed, vigor, and grant strider and unspottable Ooh, man if you could time that well that is gonna make like a charge really 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 powerful uh just like all like wow if you pop this on like your bear cavalry or your like your big monsters or even your winged lancers like that's gonna be incredible witch brew so the Hag's Cauldron erupts in a bubbling crescendo, splashing its contents in the Motherland's boundless wrath all over her hopeless enemies. Uh, Witch Brew is a breath spell that, oh, that's really cool, where you just see it like it literally dumps out on top of them and goes, uh, <laughs> that's, that's okay, that's, that's a cool effect. Uh, if you're used on enemies, it damages units in its path and applies the poison contact effect. Very nice, so it's a debuff and damage. If you overcast it, you get the Blessing version, which is Witch Broth. Damages units in its path, uh, damages units in its path while applying a contact effect to friendly units, which heals them, boosts vigor, and makes them immune to enemy contact effects? Whoa! Okay, that's cool. So if you overcast it, it's still a damage spell to enemies, but it simultaneously heals you, gives you back vigor, and makes you immune to contact effects? Holy shit, that's a really good spell. Like, man, you see your guys are like in fighting against an enemy unit that has, whether flaming attacks or magical attacks or poison attacks, and you're just like, yeah, fuck that, here's some, here, <laughs> here's some goulash, you'll be fine. Curse of the Ancient Witch. Uh, so, okay, we've got our kind of our Ancient Widow type character here. 
Um, a hooded figure summoned by the hag whispers words of terror, both mortal and immortal, to those who should never, ever have gone wandering in the woods. The basic version is Curse of the Ancient Witch, which gives enemies... Uh, l it lowers their missile block chance armor and spreads to nearby enemies within spell range. Very cool. I love that. And that's awesome for Kislev being a faction that relies so heavily on range firepower. Uh, but that's also good in co uh, melee combat just because of reducing armor. So that's great. And then Blessing of the Ancient Witch instead grants magical attacks, grants armor piercing missile damage, base missile damage, and reload skill to allies <laughs> that is gonna be gross as hell on kislev um oh my yeah that's really really good um oh this spell looks sick you just see like a bunch of spirits screaming all over the place oh uh, you see like the incarnate elemental beast like vomiting spirits on them the hag channels a malevolent spirit into an enemy's soul to saturate their being and gradually tear them to bloody minuscule shreds from the inside out. Wow, that's really fucking scary. Okay, cool. <laughs> but, uh, curse, Vengeance of Spirits. It's an area of direct damage. Damages enemies within the radiates and applies silence, which stops units from being able to use abilities or cast spells. Oh, wow, that is sick. I fucking love that. Silence is an ability that I would like to see kind of pop up more often. Uh, that's great. Hell, you use that on a character that you know relies on like big buff or like active abilities to try and do things. Or like it's a wizard hiding in the middle of a, a bunch of their units and you're just like, nope. Fuck you, you don't get to do anything for a while. Uh, let's see, if you overcast it, you get Omen of Spirits which is an area of augments, enhances the flow of winds of magic in favor of yours and your allies' spellcasters, and also deals damage in the process. So, okay, so I'm assuming that is that it deals damage to enemies while also increasing the flow of magic to your spellcasters that are within the radius. I'm assuming that's what that means. God, I'm really excited to play around with this lore of magic. Um... Cursed Cauldron, which summons a big old cauldron that starts launching little tornadoes everywhere. Very cool. Conjured up from the Hag's Cauldron, spectral missiles shoot upwards to rain carnage down upon the foe. The Cursed Cauldron, uh, the base version, is a static central vortex that fires out projectiles that spawn smaller moving vortexes upon impact. Awesome. I love it. Uh, that's a really cool effect. Bless Cauldron. It does the same thing but instead it no longer harms friendly units. Uh, cool, okay, okay. So if you use the basic version, it's gonna hurt everybody. If you use the upgraded version, it's only gonna hurt enemies. Cool, 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 cool. Which means that you could reliably use it in like a big melee fight. I like that. And then the final spell, Malediction of Madness. A sudden rush of nightmarish visions floods the victim's psyche, driving them to a fleeting madness that debilitates even the hardest warriors. It almost looks like it summons like the moon. Uh, Malediction of Madness negatively affects enemies' base weapon damage, armor-piercing damage, melee attack, and inflicts rampage. Oh! <laughs> oh! Incantation of Mania instead gives base weapon damage armor piercing weapon damage melee attack and also gives rampage that's pretty good uh de depending on how expensive that spell is to cast that could be a very very good spell like hell you know you got like a really big monster or some other like creature you don't really mind if it uh it kind of goes crazy and is just attacking the nearest enemy for a bit awesome 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 i love it so we have the Druzina. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, you know, this is much, this looks much more like kind of your rural Lord who's kind of running around doing stuff. Um, so these would be your ungoal equivalent, even though they're not using that. They're not really using that terminology anymore. The Druzina is a character steeped in Kislev lore, a lesser noble that lives beyond the walls of Kislev's great cities and tends to his own people and his lands. Ever ready to serve the Tsar Tsarina, the Druzina are well connected to the nature that surrounds them and bring with them to war items that have been handed down generation by generation. They will act as a great addition to Kislev's roster, bridging the gap that we had between the Boyars and that of Mother Ostankia and who could lead her armies. 
The Rosina are drawn from minor Kislevite nobility and consist of landowning men of sufficient means that they can afford a horse, armor, and weapons with which to defend the motherland when called upon by the Tsar. As is benefit, uh, befitting of members of the establishment, the Rosina have a disdain for city dwellers and are keen on preserving the rural hierarchy that uh, provides their power and status, but are also self-sufficient, resourceful, and have a healthy attitude to the very real likelihood that they will be killed during military service. The Drusina's main weapon of choice is the Great Axe. Very nasty when swung with conviction, yet they also carry a bow. I love the design. Uh, they look really, really cool. I like the fur hats. Um, oh, so they have big two-handed axes. Ooh, fun. Uh, all right. Despite being a faction of hybrid units, Kislev has lacked a truly hybrid lord type to sit in between the melee-focused boyar and the magic-focused ice witch. The Druzina subscribes to this playstyle by supporting missile lines with his abilities while holding his own melee with powerful armor-piercing great weapon. Hybrid. He deals significant single-target damage with his bow and able to deal armor-piercing damage with the axe of melee. Very cool. Uh, he's good at uh, enhancing your missile units nearby. And he can replenish used ammo. Awesome. Okay, so cool. So he's kind of he's kind of your engineer-ish type character. Uh, which I think works perfectly well. Um, I and I think this will be a very well suited character to leading um the army. I mean, this we literally talked about this on a stream of that. If you can't have hag mothers, the next best thing is what essentially would be a a ungol um leader, but a, a hybrid uh type fighter that brings a different dynamic to the battlefield, which is awesome. So now with Kislev armies, you have three generic lords now. Where you have your magic lord with the ice witches, you have your um, pure melee super heavy tank lord with your boyar, and then you have your Druzina. And they can't ride bears! Oh, thank god! <laughs> There's no bear! They just ride war horses, which really helps separate them from the boyars. I, I know there's some people who are going to be like, Where, where's the bear? I'm glad there's no bear. Oh, Naryeska? Whoa! She is very different looking than I was expecting. Look how heavily armored she is. I thought like you'd be able to see her face or something, but nah, she is like, nah, fuck that. I am <laughs> I am armored up. You cannot tell what I look like under this. <laughs> I am I am armor. God, that is a beautiful design. I love that you have that really uh, 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 like it kind of reminds me of the armor styles that ancient Kislev would have had on like the Eastern steppes. Um, that is super sick. I love this. Bouncing out the legendary heroes uh, meant we had to find a character. The Golden Knight is the champion of the Ice Queen. This is an honorary rank bestowed to the greatest warrior among the Druzina. Oh, or occasionally in history, sometimes boyars or even common soldiery. Uh, 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 Narieska is the daughter of the previous Golden Knight who died at the side of Tsar Boris. Ah, that would make a ton of sense. Um, I was curious when he died, because there, there were mentions about him. Um, uh, but it would make all the sense in the universe that he died alongside Tsar Boris, um, at the, uh, oh god, I forget which river they were fighting on. Uh, I want to say it was the River Linsk that they were fighting on, where they, where, uh, Boris was dragged down. So the fact that his greatest soldier died next to him is appropriate, but awesome. Um, and also sad. As a girl, uh, Nareska learned swordcraft from her father, honing her skills as a warrior from the, from the finest in the realm. Though she was derided by her peers, she stood forward as a candidate of, as the guardian of the Tsarina when the Druzina elected her father's successor. Narieska is tall and powerfully built, the physical equal of any mighty warrior, but her greatest attribute is her determination. She's an Undertale character. <laughs> Such is her drive that she trains longer and more intensely than any other, and in battle she fights with a fury born of stubborn pride. In Kislev, she is unmatched in combat. Every Golden Knight is consecrated by the cult of Ursin, and so Narieska bears both religious ornamentation and the favor of the Ice Court. In this way, she unifies the divided church and the state. Um, I do like that she is from among the Druzina, which means that her father was as well. That ties in really, really well to understanding how Boris uh, Ursus kind of treated um, 
the more rural aspects of his nation where he pulled a champion from among the, the rural folk and that his daughter followed in his footsteps by literally taking on the daughter of uh, her father's guardian. Uh, though it seems that she was elected by a kind of a council of Druzina as opposed to being selected by Katarin herself. The Queen of Kislev's champion known, is known as the Golden Knight, an honorary rank bestowed upon the finest warrior from among the ranks of the Druzina, although boyars or even the common soldiery have on occasion risen to the position. The current incumbent is Narieska Lesa, daughter of the previous Golden Knight who was killed in battle at Tsar Boris's side. In spite of fierce opposition from her peers, Narieska was promoted to champion on merit, for she is easily the physical capable of any man, or physical equal of any man, and twice as determined, having learned swordcraft from the finest practitioners in the land. On the battlefield, she is a whirlwind of furious attacks born of her stubborn, prideful nature, and unmatched in single combat. I fucking love her design. She looks really, really good. Um, God, that is a sick looking design. I love the armor. The Golden Knight is a heavily armored guardian hero with a focus on protecting nearby characters and bringing the resolve of her com uh, buffing the resolve of her comrades nearby. Wearing a full suit of armor and wielding the powerful magical sword known as Urson's Claw, she is a bulwark. I can't tell if they misspelled Urson here or if it's a different Urson. Um, <laughs> because that, that might not be a spelling error. I assume it is, though. Uh, but she is a bulwark, which many a foe will have difficulty overcoming. Bodyguard. The Golden Knight is an exceptional protector using her defensive abilities and stats to increase the durability of nearby friendly lords and heroes. Inspiration. The more damage sustained by the Golden Knight, the more determined surrounding friendly units become to fight on. Okay, that's pretty cool because that means she actually is, she has some cool callbacks to kind of Kostaltin where Kostaltin is a character who, as he takes more damage, um, when he reaches certain thresholds, he gets more powerful because he gets like, you know, he has like his regen and he also gets like way tankier and a bunch of other stuff when he gets low on health. So I like that she kind of has a call out to that part of the Ursonite cult where as she takes more damage, she is like, no, I'm not going to die. Fuck you. And gets more and more stubborn um, and resilient. That's cool. And then a duelist. The Golden Knight's durability and powerful sword allow her to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with melee lords and heroes. She looks amazing. She looks amazing. And she can ride a warhorse. Okay, so she, you know, she's like a Druzina. She doesn't have anything fancier than that. Cool beans. All right. Kislevite warriors. <laughs> they, they dug really deep when they were coming up with the name for this unit. <laughs> they, they went. They went down to the absolute true depths of creativity and said, what about Kislevite warriors? <laughs> uh, let's see. We've come to better understand that not every unit in the DLC needs to be a centerpiece monster. Thank you. And headed in the other direction with this new unit, plugging a much needed lower tier infantry gap. The Kislevite warriors armed with their halberds are tier one troops that are decent withstanding a charge and bound by their blood to fight to the bitter end for Kislev. We've taken inspiration in their design from older Mordheim miniatures. Oh, that's cool. Just like the Druzina and creating something with a much closer look and feel to the lands and woods that Mother Ostankia protects. That is so nice. Just a really solid, low-tier halberd infantry unit. Kislev desperately needed this. That is very, very good. The grim and hearty appearance of these men of the Oblast tells, uh, tell tales of a lifetime of endurance. Nothing matters more to Kislevi warriors than the defense of the motherland against the insidious forces of the ruinous powers and the preservation of a way of life stretching back many centuries. Tasks they undertake with grim determination armed with razor-sharp blades. They are deeply religious, cherishing the traditional Kislevi gods, but chiefly Ursin, the bear god, bear god? Bear god from whom they surely draw their strength in combat. Such men are also extremely loyal to the Tsar and his family, whom they consider to be important symbols of Kislev just as much as Father Bear himself. Awesome. Uh, I Yeah, cool. Great. I think this is a really solid unit. I love the really crazy designs of their halberds. Those things are wicked looking. Um, but uh, yeah, these are going to be super duper cool. Kislevite warriors are halberd wielding infantry that occupy a low price point within the Kislev roster. Because they don't pay the tax of being a hybrid unit, Kislevite warriors have more entities than a standard Kislevite infantry unit, which makes them a more effective meat shield for the rest of your army. 
They're cheap. They're the cheapest true melee unit of the Kislev roster, making them a great pick in the early game. They have anti-large, thanks to their halberds, and their frontline troops because they have more entities, which is great. The Frostworm. Whoa. Oh, it's like an actual Frostworm. Instead of that goofy... Whoa, that thing looks amazing! Oh my god, that looks so good! Oh, frost Frostworms have been, chat have been talked about in... Uh, northern lore for a long time. I always found the Frostworm of Norska to be kind of eh, because it's, you know, it's literally just a Chaos Dragon. Um, you may recognize the same if you've ever ventured into Norska or played a campaign of theirs. Now called a Chaos Frost Dragon, the Norskan unit is very different to Kislev's true Frostworm. A hulking, flightless beast. Deadly in combat with its massive fang jaws, scything claws, and a vicious lashing tail. The Frostworm acts as both an individual unit or a mount for Katarin and Ice Witches. Oh, the day of the bear is over. The day of the bear is over. This is such a cool mount. Oh my, your Ice Witches can have a monster mount? This actually looks very... Um, a, it's obviously very similar to the uh, the Cathayan dragons, except for it runs around on foot and can't fly. Um, but this also really, really gives me hope that we're going to get the shard dragon for the dwarfs. I don't think we're going to get the shard dragon in Thrones of Decay. Um, I, I don't think it matches that DLC. But I do really hope we get the shard dragon one day in the uh, in the far future because this would be a it would be a similar design, uh, though obviously without any ice effects. Wow, I fucking love this design. That is a beautiful monster. Frost worms are creatures of magic who primarily roast in the crags of Shardgun. Swift and sinuous who sleep away the warmest parts of the year in hibernation, venturing out onto the oblast to hunt prey when the weather is at its coldest. Their natural prey are the wandering herbivorous beasts which are easily devoured whole by an adult frost worm in times of... Oh, adult frost worm. Period. There should be a period there. In times of famine, they have been known to consume Chaos Beasts too, taking savage delight in chomping down on a troll or minotaur when the need arises. Beings of ice magic, Frostworms are naturally al aligned to the witches of the Ice Court. In desperation, an ice witch will travel to the crags and beseech the slumbering worms for aid, and it is not unknown for a Frostworm to answer their calls in the times of coldest winter. The Ice Queen's power is such that winter travels where she does, and no Frostworm would ever refuse her. Uh, this is brilliant. I love this design. It's a nice big monster that's not like too big. Oh, interesting. She's, oh, oh, for Katarin and the Ice Witch. That's awesome. So that makes the Ice Witch Lord really, really unique. Very, very dynamic. Um, I also like that it's not a colossal monster. Yeah, they, they specifically say here that it's more on par with a Stegodon or a Hydra. That's great. It would have been easy for them to be like, oh, the Frost Dragon, let's make it like this big giant fucking thing. I'm glad that it's more a, a more reasonable tier monster. Um, this is fantastic. Um, you know, we, we I talked about on stream that if I had been picking out a monster, I would have gone for the Frost Fiend. Uh, the Frost Fiends being big like bat creatures. So, you know, I always kind of imagine it being like a terror geist, but alive, icy and like fluffy. Um but this is great. Like I just, I just wanted an uh, like kind of a more more elemental creatures, right? More kind of the that the creatures that really live along that line of being a spirit of the land versus like a regular flesh and blood creature. And this is perfect. This is perfect for that. Uh, you know, I was imagining a big bat, but a a serpentine land lizard. Perfect, because there's really, we don't really have any monsters that are look like this thing. Like, obviously, it it has some similarities to the Cathayan dragons, but they can't walk on the ground. They just fly everywhere. Like, even when you get them on the ground, they don't walk. They kind of just float just above the ground. So, this is a genuinely new monster with a new skeleton and new animations. So, I am extremely happy with this. I was not expecting this at all. Uh, the Frostworm is a deadly mid-tier monster that which can move its way across the battlefield relatively quickly for a monster of its size. With the top end of the roster getting particularly crowded, 
The Frostward's power level is comparable to that of a Dark Elf War Hydra or the Stegodon of the Lizardmen. This enables it to really stand out on its own as a unique pick when compared to the Elemental Bear or the Incarnate Elemental of Beasts. Fast. The Frostworm is, a, is fast for a creature of its size, which enables it to maneuver into position quicker than most. Neat. Uh, obviously it has Frostbite, so it slows people, and it can be used as a mount instead of just being a regular creature where you can have it for uh, Ice Queen Katarin or the generic Ice Witch, which is awesome. Awesome. God damn it. Of course, they're like, oh, yeah, sure. We'll give Katarin her sled and an ice dragon because fuck you. <laughs> Leave it to CA to eternally be like, why would we give you an awesome chariot mount when we could also give you a monstrous mount looking at Chariot of the God Cetra over there? Um, all right. The ice sled. Um, oh, they don't have the uh, I kind of want to see an in-game model. It looks really, really cool. Uh, okay, okay, so it's pulled by snow horses. All right. I can't tell you how pleased the team are to finally be releasing the Ice Court Sled and Game for you all. It's been on our wish list like yours, uh, many of you, since Warhammer 3. Um, this is a free LC. You don't need to have anything new for this. Um, the Ice Court's reinforced sled is drawn by mighty steeds with breath like the winter wind and whose flanks shimmer with glittering ice crystals. I like it. Looks cool. I can't wait to see it actual in model. Like the wind. It's pulled by six steeds? Holy shit. Okay, I was not expecting that to be nearly that many. I thought it was going to be two, <laughs> not six. Wow. Okay, that's a lot of horses. Um, the ice court sled is the quickest way for Kettering to move around the battlefield. Indomitable. The momentum of this sled is extremely high, allowing it to push through enemy infantry lines with ease, making an effective mount. Oh, awesome! It has Ice Guard crew! Oh, that's cool! That's fucking awesome! Two members of the Ice Guard are on as well, who fire their ice bows from the sled, allowing it to be used as a missile chariot in a pinch. That is kick-ass. I fucking love it. Okay, wow, the ice sled is a lot cooler than I was expecting. Um, cause I thought they were just going to do the original tabletop model, which is pulled by like two horses and it only has Katarin on it. Um, so the fact that it's Katarin, two ice guard that are firing arrows and it's pulled by six horses. So it's like super fast and has a lot of weight to it. Very nice. Very nice. All right. I hope you enjoyed learning about all the new characters, units, and spells coming to Kislev, as I have an added treat for you lore lovers out next week that I touched on at the beginning of this blog. We have again partnered with Black Larry novelist, uh, bleh, bleh, novelist David Geimer to bring you a wonderful dark tale, Things in the Wood, taking a closer look at Mother Ostankia and the Kingdom of Kislev. Total War account holders, keep your eyes peeled. I am super excited for that. So now you've heard about all the new additions, we wanted to put them all in one place where you could look at them all together. <laughs> this feels like this feels like a fucking like super smash brothers reveal like it starts over here and then it's like everyone is here um yeah oh okay so there's you can see the wow the ice sled is huge look at the size of that fucker um oh the golden knight looks so good he's got that big ass shield and everything oh this looks so good this looks so good. Oh, man. Yeah, that's nice. That's nice. So Kislev got two new units. Zinch got two new units. Cathay got two new units. Then we got the two new legendary heroes. And we got the two new lords and the two new heroes. This looks incredible. This looks absolutely fucking incredible. Um, I'm really, really pleased with how Shadows of Change has turned out. Um, I would love to know what you all think down in the comment section below. Does this save Shadows of Change for you? Are you kind of like, eh, about it still? Is there anything you were hoping to get that you didn't? Is there anything you were not expecting to get that you did? And what is your favorite new addition? Um, I can assure you as soon as I can, we're going to play the shit out of this. Um, I don't, I don't even know who I'm going to start with. Like, I, I think I'm going to play Kislev first because I'm really excited about like the new, 
the new, like the new Lords of Magic plus the legendary hero plus the monster and all that stuff. I, like I, they, everybody got a lot of really cool things. Um, I and I think many people are also looking forward to the patch notes to see like all of the really like nitty gritty changes. But um, yeah, can't wait for David Geimer's new lore story to actually give us like a full on story about Mother Ostankia. Um, also very excited for the patch notes and excited to just play it. So thank you all so much for watching. Uh, I hope this was enjoyable. We'll be back very, very soon with more stuff. Um, I think for me personally, God, this is fucking hard, dude. I, I think for me personally, my favorite new unit is either Satang, the Golden Knight, or the Frostworm. Pro pro my new, fa my favorite new generic thing is the Frostworm. Um, but like, man, I am really pleased, uh, with, with all of this. So anyway, uh, thank you all very much for watching. I'll see you again real soon. Uh, take care of yourselves. Have a lovely weekend. Uh, I'll be, I'll be streaming later today to kind of just talk about this casually. Uh, so if you're interested in coming by the stream and saying hello, please do. And, uh, I'll see you when I see you. Bye-bye.